Today we are just going to be getting a briefing from the department on the elections that have taken place, I think it's Angola, Lesotho and Kenya. And thereafter we will have a discussion. But before we do that, do we have apologies, Lubabalo? Uh, good morning, Jefferson and all of the members. Uh, we have uh, three apologies, Chair. Uh, one from the Minister, she's on an official visit to the US, and Deputy Minister Masha Khodlamini, she's also on an official visit at uh, Sierra Leone. And uh, Orvo Msale said that she be, she's running late, so she'll join the meeting. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, there's a, a helicopter passing here. I'm sorry, honorable members, it's a helicopter passing here, so there's nothing one can do about it. Thank you very much for those apologies. Honorable members, do we have a mover for adoption of the agenda? Honorable Chair, to move second. Honorable Faba. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. We'll now give over to Admin to do the presentation. Good, good morning, Honorable Chair. Yes, Comrade uh, Elvin Bortes, the Deputy Minister, Honorable Member. Yes, good morning, uh, Honorable uh, Obakeng uh, Ramule Tsimaumopelo. Yes, uh, I like your shirt. It looks green. Uh, on yes, a, uh, on, thank you on very much. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Chair, for that. Um, uh, no, Chair, I, I want to indicate, of course, uh, the minister is still engaged with the, our multilateral work um, and uh, is soon to return to, uh, to South Africa. But I thought it's uh, important just to um, emphasize the critical nature of today's presentation, Chair, uh, because really it's about the, the African agenda and ensuring a, that we hold a successful, uh, free and credible uh, elections, which... Uh, I think Honorable Chair will appreciate it's one of the key tenets of uh, uh, good governance. Uh, in addition, Honorable Chair, the elections on the African continent, of course, is governed by treaties, uh, which all member states of the African Union and SADC have adopted, uh, and in particular, the African Charter on uh, Democracy, Elections and Governance, uh, which calls for state parties to promote the holding of regular, free and fair elections to institutionalize uh, legitimate authority and representative government, as well as democratic chains of, of government. Yeah. Um, to further solidify um, the charter, it uh, evidently, Honorable Chair, calls on state parties to, and I quote, to reaffirm their commitment to regular holding of transparent, free uh, and fair elections, uh, unquote. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, Honorable Chair, the SADC principles and guidelines governing uh, democratic uh, elections uh, aim to promote the uh, enhanced adherence to the principle of the rule of law, premise upon the respect for and supremacy of the constitution and constitutional order in the political arrangements of the respected member states uh, holding elections. Uh, the principles and guidelines further aim, Honorable Chair, to uh, promote uh, the holding of regular fair, free and fair elections, transparent, credible and peaceful democratic elections uh, to institutionalize uh, legitimate authority of representative uh, government, uh, Chair, and enhance electoral integrity and I think that that really is a is an area of uh, emphasis. Uh, our submission from Turku Chair is that um, 
the, the, the convening of regular elections has actually become uh, the norm uh, on our African continent. And uh, I think when we look in the mirror, Honorable Chair, um, it details how far we have come since the days of coup, coup d'etats and unconstitutional uh, chains of uh, government. Uh, of course, we, we must note that the recent experiences in Mali, Burkina Faso, Guinea, Chad, uh, and Sudan uh, does not present uh, the, the, the value system of the African Union and its, uh, and its wrecks. And I think we, we have emphasized as a, as, as, as a government of South Africa that where constitutional changes of government that actually takes place, we are calling on firmer and stronger actions uh, to be taking, taken by the respective uh, REC and the AU. Uh, uh, so that I think it's a critical issue. I think, Honorable Chair, uh, the presentation um, will, of course, capture the, the fact that the peoples of Kenya and Angola have shown resilience and commitment to the peaceful elections. Uh, that recently actually has been uh, convened. And uh, I think it's a testimony uh, to the investment from these uh, two governments uh, in relation to aspiration three of the African uh, Union Agenda 2063, which amongst other sites in Africa of good governance, democracy, respect for human rights, justice uh, and the rule of law, in the rule of law. Of course, Chair, as I conclude, uh, the kingdom of Lesotho, our immediate uh, neighbor within close proximity, will be going to the polls uh, on the 7th of October uh, this year. Uh, we also know, Chair, that the elections takes place at the end of the South African-led uh, SADC uh, facilitation process. Uh, which saw the conclusion of a long-haul dialogue amongst the Basutu on the types of reforms required uh, within the political landscape of uh, Lesotho. Uh, we, we evidently know, Chair, that since the appointment of President Ramaphosa um, as the facilitator of this process, supported by a, a facilitation uh, team led by former Deputy Chief Justice uh, Mosaneki work uh, has tirelessly uh, uh, been undertaken to actually uh, conform to the mandate of the SADC facilitation uh, team. The final mi mil milestone of the facilitation team uh, agenda chair was to see the adoption by parliament of the Omnibus Constitutional Amendment Bill, which uh, its purpose was to amend the 1993 uh, Lesotho uh, constitution and other reforms direct, uh, directives. Unfortunately, honorable members, um, the bill could not pass before parliament uh, uh, dissolved ahead of uh, the elections. Nevertheless, the elections are going uh, ahead as, as planned. We must confirm that SADC has deployed its uh, elections observer uh, mission in South Africa, Chair contributed uh, members to that uh, ob uh, elections observer missions. And it is expected that all other SADC uh, formations, such as the SADC Parliamentary Forum and the SADC Electoral uh, Commission Forum will also uh, uh, be deployed. Uh, lastly, Chair, uh, it will be good if we get your permission to uh, invite uh, the Foreign Service uh, of Derko uh, to, to do a detailed presentation on these three areas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deputy Minister. Thanks very much for those opening remarks. Over to the Department Foreign Service Unit. Over to you.
Chairperson, um, Honorable Fabia, something is foreign here. I, I, I don't hear anything. Is or is it just me? Good morning, good morning, Chairperson, uh, Deputy Minister. My name is Kazamla Chawani. Um, I just wanted to quickly check if Ambassador Bungani is in the platform, uh, because when we arranged, he was supposed to first deal with the Kenya general elections, and then I will do Angola and the Kingdom of Lesotho's readiness uh, through you, Chair. Uh, good morning, uh, Honorable Chair and uh, and Honorable Members, uh, Deputy Minister of Waters, uh, and uh, and colleagues. Uh, my name is Mbule Lopungani. I'm doing the Kenya presentation. There was uh, an agreement with the acting DG that she was going to do the introduction of the two presenters, uh, but it looks like something has not gone right. Uh, so uh, if I may proceed then uh, with your permission, Chairperson, uh, to present the uh, Kenyan general elections of 2022. Can I proceed, uh, Chairperson? I'm not sure if Chairperson, you can be able to hear me on that side. Okay. I can hear you, Madam uh, Acting DG. Okay, uh, Ambassador Pungani, if you allow me, uh, Mr. Chairperson can continue with the presentation. I'm not sure if I'm audible on that side. Chair, there seems to be problems of connection and connectivity here. Can we have a better connect coordination? I'm not sure what's happening. Uh, Mr. Nkosi, we hear you from this side. I can hear you. I'm Bungani and I'm ready to present Kenya. I don't know whether I'm audible that side. Yeah, I think maybe let's ask... Uh, Mr. Sikwala to check with the chair if he's, if he's still in the meeting. Okay, no thanks, we'll hear from you. And because once I ask you, Mr. Nkosi, you will be the one that is that will be showing the presentation on the screen. No, I'm just saying let's check, let's check uh, with Mr. Sikwala if the chair is in the meeting so that you can uh, run the meeting properly. Okay, Mr. no thank Sikwala, you. <clears throat> Chairperson Honorable Faber. Chairperson, can you hear me? Uh, it, uh, honorable members, it looks as if the chair is uh, on the platform, but is uh, not uh, muted. So he needs to unmute or is having a, a challenge, but it's, it's appearing on the uh, participants list. So I think uh, Honorable Ngos is correct. Let uh, Mr. Squeller check whether uh, he's uh, <clears throat> having uh, some network problems and then we can take it from there as Honorable Ngos has suggested. Yeah, I, I just think this this is very clear that, that we should start the face-to-face -face meetings again. Um, this is happening quite too often, and, and I really do believe we do have premises where we can do this with committee rooms. I really do think um, this is getting ridiculous. It's every time we have meetings. The only good meeting was the one we had last week where we had face-to-face. -face. 
So if we can perhaps start looking into that again, thank you. Uh, one of members, may I suggest that uh, Honorable Mpanza chair the meeting while we try to look for the chairperson so that we don't waste uh, much time. Agreed. I'll second that motion. No, thanks, uh, uh, Honorable Court, for the suggestion. And uh, Honorable Members uh, for, for agreeing. I think let's pose the challenges out of the chair. So can uh, we allow the presenters now to proceed uh, as uh, <clears throat> they have arranged from the department? Uh, acting uh, DG, just lead us and tell us who is presenting, but we can even see the presentation on the screen is rated. Uh, department. Honorable members uh, of the committee and honorable cha chairperson, uh, apologies uh, because we're struggling with the connection on our side as well. Uh, we've got Ambassador Pungane who will be presenting um, on the election, the outcome of the elections in, in Kenya. And Ambassador Pungane will be followed by Mr. Chabane who will also present on the elections in Angola but also share Diko's uh, observation and analysis of, of the readiness of the kingdom of Lesotho to hold its elections in the coming month. If you allow me, Chairperson, can I uh, allow Ambassador Pungane to, to present, please? Thank you. Yes, uh, DG, we are in your hands. I Ambassador think, uh, Pungane, you, please go ahead. You just allow them as, they, as you have uh, lined them up. Okay. and then we'll take it from there. No, thank you once more, uh, Honorable Acting Chair, uh, the Deputy Minister, uh, uh, the... So, members sorry, Honorable the Members, I had a bit of a... a bit of a distraction here, so I'm sorry. Thanks, Honorable Mpanzi. Okay, if, if I can proceed... Uh, and uh, on the screen now is the overview of the presentation that I'm going to make. Uh, we'll, provi we'll provide some historical overview of elections in, uh, in Kenya in the past, uh, starting with 2007 elections, uh, deal with the, the current uh, or the just uh, concluded uh, elections, uh, where the presidential candidates, uh, uh, the results that were announced and the subsequent uh, challenge, uh, court challenge that was launched uh, on the results. Uh, then we'll conclude with two issues, uh, just briefly from what we have been able to source, uh, what is the likely uh, foreign policy that will be followed by the new administration uh, and how we see our future relations, that is South Africa and Kenya. So that will be the overview of the, of the presentation. Uh, on the first item, uh, before the elections, we, as the desk, we were a little bit anxious on how the elections were going to, to turn out uh, due to the history of uh, electoral violence uh, that happened uh, in Kenya, uh, especially in the 2007 uh, elections uh, that resulted in more than a thousand people uh, uh, that were killed uh, in the violence that followed the announcement of the elections. Uh, 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 in those elections, uh, and we'll return to this uh, later on, is that Mr. Uh, Odinga was a contestant. He had challenged the, the outcome of the elections, uh, but was not uh, successful. And in the aftermath of the elections and the violence that I referred to earlier, uh, was that Mr. Uhuru Kenyatta and uh, Mr. William Ruto, uh, Ruto uh, were indicted in the international criminal court in The Hague uh, for their alleged uh, role in the, in the violence. Uh, however, uh, Mr. Kenyatta was subsequently acquitted and the charges against uh, uh, Mr. Ruto were withdrawn. Uh, I think there was another person that was charged with him, a certain journalist. Uh, so they couldn't proceed with the, with the case uh, due to 
uh, lack of evidence, and they were subsequently withdrawn. The 2012 uh, elections uh, were won with were won by Mr. Uh, Uhuru Kenyatta, uh, who had Mr. Ruto as his uh, running mate. Uh, they were the campaign under the platform of the Jubilee uh, uh, Coalition. Uh, the 2017 elections uh, again, uh, Mr. Uh, Uhuru Kenyatta won the, the elections, uh, but the results were challenged by Mr. Odinga, who had contested these elections uh, as well. Uh, the case subsequently was uh, heard by the Kenya Supreme Court, uh, and they nullified the outcome of the, of the results. Uh, the uh, court uh, made some uh, findings against the uh, Independent Electoral uh, Commission of Kenya, uh, uh, alleging that or declaring that they had committed some irregularities and illegalities uh, during the, the electoral uh, process. Uh, amongst the findings was that, uh, you know, the commission did not conduct elections in accordance with the laws of Kenya, including the constitution, uh, that there were uh, irregularities, uh, especially with the transmission of results from the polling stations to the National Tallying uh, Center. Uh, the, and as a result, the court had declared that there must be a rerun of the, of the elections. Uh, and in the fresh elections that followed, uh, Mr. Kenyatta uh, won the, uh, the elections. Uh, uh, his opponent had uh, declined to participate or did not participate in the rerun of the elections. Uh, and therefore, Kenyatta was uh, or secured uh, a second term in office. If you can go to the next slide, please. And then coming to the uh, to the 2020 general elections, uh, there were a number of elections that were held uh, simultaneously. First, it was the presidential elections, uh, the elections for the governors, elections for members of the National Assembly and the Senate, uh, the county uh, assemblies, as well as ward representatives. So it was a combination of presidential, and as in our case, uh, uh, parliamentary elections uh, plus local government elections, uh, although they are structured uh, differently from us, uh, is, the, is the governors, uh, the national assembly, the senate, the county assemblies, as well as the uh, ward uh, representatives. Uh, uh, the population currently of, of Kenya is estimated at about 54.9 million people, uh, and only 22 million people had registered as, uh, as voters. Uh, this was slightly up from the previous elections of, of 2017, which had 19.6 uh, 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 voters. Uh, and according to the analysis that was done by the uh, Electoral uh, Commission, uh, is that uh, from the registered voters, 39.8% were, were young voters. Uh, so the uh, elections uh, really, in terms of the, you know, the observation by various international observers, uh, including you know, the Commonwealth, the, the European Union, the African Union, the East African Community, and COMESA, uh, they were uh, loaded as having been uh, largely peaceful and, and done uh, 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 above average. I'm not sure exactly what they meant about that, but uh, they were largely peaceful. Uh, our mission in Nairobi also uh, went to a few police stations and they concurred with the observation that the international teams had, uh, had made. Uh, but one of the observations that was made uh, was that uh, the uh, the voter turnout, comparatively speaking, was, was the lowest uh, in the 15 years of electoral uh, processes in, uh, in Kenya. Uh, it was uh, uh, reported at 65.4%, uh, uh, and by Kenyan standards, uh, that was regarded as, as being low, because in some elections, the turnout was as high as more than 80% uh, of, of voters, uh, and hence the you know, the, 
categorization of these uh, elections as having had the lowest uh, uh, voter turnout. Uh, if you can move to the next uh, elections, and uh, the last line was about the the number of voters, uh, but I've spoken about the percentage of the of those that turned out. Uh, and another feature of these elections was that, you know, since uh, 1990, there was uh, the lowest number of uh, presidential candidates. Uh, and the candidates that uh, contested uh, included those four that are, are listed. Uh, uh, Mr. Raila Odinga, who's age 77. Uh, and one feature of the elections in, uh, in Kenya that I may just uh, mention now is that, uh, Around elections, various political parties uh, form coalitions uh, uh, because in the history of the of the Kenya elections, uh, uh, no single party uh, can win elections on its own, and that's the phenomena of having uh, coalition partners. Uh, and some of them are formed are formed uh, just uh, before the elections, uh, like this year, this Azimuo. La Umoja uh, coalition between uh, Mr. or President, former President uh, Kenyatta's Jubilee Party, as well as uh, Mr. Odinga's uh, Orange Democratic Orange Democratic Party, were the main uh, coalition partners. But there were others, uh, smaller parties that also were part of that coalition. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned uh, previously, it was not the first time that. Uh, Mr. Raila Odinga contested the elections. Yeah, he had done so on five previous uh, occasions and had not been uh, successful uh, in those elections. And then the other contendent, contestant was Dr. William uh, Ruto, who was uh, at the time of the elections, the deputy president of, uh, of Kenya, having been the deputy president since 2013. Uh, he had his own coalition uh, uh, called the Kenya Kwanza Alliance uh, uh, that had different parties. Uh, some of the known ones are the ones that are mentioned in the, on the screen, the United Democratic Alliance, the Amani National Congress, and the Forum for the Restoration of Democracy in, in Kenya fought. Uh, and then the, so those were the two main uh, contenders. Uh, and then the other two, uh, Mr. David uh, Wahinga and George Wazakoya, uh, completed the four uh, candidates that went to contest uh, the elections. If you can move to the next slide, please. Uh, and then on the 15th, the elections took place on the 9th of August. And then on the 15th of August, uh, the Electoral Com Commission, uh, the IEBC, uh, declared uh, President uh, or Dr. William Ruto as the president-elect of, uh, of Kenya. There was a bit of drama on that, uh, on that day. Uh, and it was, some of it was shown live on, uh, on TV. Uh, what transpired is that the, before the announcement, the for uh, the IEBC is constituted by seven uh, members, and four of them, uh, you know, disassociated themselves from the results that were announced. Uh, so shortly before the results were announced, they held a, a press conference where they disassociated themselves from the from the results that were going to be announced. Uh, and in the Tallinn Center, you saw it on TV. There are lots of commotion and according to the report uh, there were people that tried to prevent the chairperson from announcing the results uh, but in the end he, he did uh, announce the uh, the results uh, and the outcome uh, of the race uh, and the results that were announced were as, as follows uh, and just before i go to the results is that in terms of the kenyan constitution uh, the person to win in the first round, he had to get 50% uh, plus one uh, votes uh, and then have the support of the, at least of 25% of the votes uh, that were cast in the various uh, counties of, uh, of Kenya. Uh, so it must be 
25% of the votes in the in the counties, and then 50 uh, plus one of the of the overall uh, uh, voting public. And the announced results uh, were that uh, Dr. Ruto uh, garnered 50.59 uh, of the of the votes percent of the votes. Uh, Mr. Odinga uh, got 48.85 percent, uh, Mr. Muari, uh, 0.23 percent, and then uh, George uh, Wajakoya uh, got 0 0.44 percent of the of the vote. Uh, so uh, Mr. Ruto uh, met the requirement for to be, you know, to be get the president uh, elect uh, I think on the day of the elections uh, and subsequently, uh, Mr. Odinga rejected the results of the of the elections. Uh, and in terms of the law, he had certain days by which to lodge his formal uh, complaint, which he duly did on the on the twenty second of uh, of August. Uh, but what I want to to mention, uh, which was quite important, is that uh, on the fifteenth, whilst he rejected the, the outcome of the of the of the elections, uh, he called upon his uh, uh, supporters to to remain calm uh, and not to resort to any violence, and that he was going to challenge the the results using. Uh, legal means, which was quite important. And as a result, uh, I think there was one or two uh, uh, incidences uh, uh, not major in, in his uh, constituency, uh, but other than that, uh, the whole country was quite uh, peaceful uh, on the day that the results were, 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 were announced. Uh, so he lost the, the lawsuit. Uh, and he asked that uh, the uh, the court nullify the outcome of the of the of the elections uh, on various uh, grounds, uh, including the fact that you know the percentages and the uh, didn't quite uh, add up uh, uh, when you know when he was doing his arithmetic. Uh, so the in the challenge that was uh, presented to, to court, uh, uh, the Supreme Court had to uh, make a ruling on the following uh, issues. Uh, the first one was whether the technology that the IEBC had used uh, in managing the elections uh, met the standards of integrity, verifiability, security, and transparency uh, to guarantee accurate and verifiable results. So that was the first. Uh, uh, issue that the court had to, uh, to decide upon. Uh, the next one, please. The next one was whether there was interference uh, in uploading and transmission of the form 3.334A uh, from the polling stations to the to the IPC portal. That is where the uh, results were being uh, up uploaded. I think the form is one of the forms that would be completed uh, from the polling stations, uh, uh, tabulating the results of the of the polling stations. And then the third uh, issue was whether there was uh, a difference between those forms that were uploaded in the portal and the and the forms that were received at the at the national uh, telling center uh, and the forms that were issued by the polling agents. Then the fourth uh, uh, area that uh, was contested or the court had to decide on was whether the postponement of the gubernatorial, uh, we made a, uh, an error that is not national, is the gubernatorial elections, uh, which essentially is the governor elections uh, in our normal languages. Uh, whether the governor elections that took place or that were postponed in uh, two counties uh, in Kakamega and Mombasa, as well as parliamentary elections uh, in, in some of those uh, uh, wards and counties, 
resulted uh, in voter suppress, uh, suppression uh, to the detriment of the of the petitioners. The petitioners are the uh, the is Odinga. There were a few others that had gone to court to to challenge the the outcome of the of the elections. Whether the those postponements uh, affected uh, the outcome negatively or to the detriment of the of Mr. Odinga and uh, and, and the others. And then the lastly, whether there were inexplicable discrepancies between the votes cast for the presidential elections and other elective positions. And the other elections positions would be the parliamentary elections, the uh, gubernatorial, notorial uh, elections, as well as the, the counties, uh, whether there were any inexplicable uh, discrepancies. Uh, and then the court, uh, dismissed the uh, all the claims of the of the petitioners uh, and declared that uh, mr uh, uh, ruto was duly elected as the president elect and the court was unanimous in its decision uh, in its outcome uh, and uh, mr odinga still uh, did not accept the the ruling uh, uh, in one of the comments, he was saying it was more for a political uh, decision than a judicial decision. Uh, so he rejected the uh, the outcome, but he accepted the results. Uh, I hope I'm putting it uh, uh, properly. And, and since then, we have not heard from from him. Uh, and then, uh, Mr. Uh, Oh, Dr. Ruto was then uh, duly inaugurated on the 13th of, uh, of September uh, for a five-year term uh, as the president of, uh, of Kenya. Uh, we are invited to South Africa uh, to be represented at the inauguration and uh, uh, President uh, Ramaphosa was uh, specifically invited, but due to other commitments, he, he uh, then... Uh, appointed the deputy president to represent him at the elections and he duly participated in the inauguration uh, ceremony on the 13th of September. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of the foreign policy, uh, and we really uh, sourced the information that we are sharing from the manifesto of the Kenya Kwanzaa uh, coalition. Uh, uh, some of the issues that they had uh, pointed out in their uh, manifesto was that uh, Kenya is uh, uh, considered as a, as a partner uh, uh, in, the, in the region. I think they made a mistake. It's not necessarily South Africa's partner, uh, but I think they consider themselves as a, you know, an anchor state uh, in, the, in, the, in the East Africa region, uh, being the only country that uh, hosts the United Nations uh, headquarters. Uh, they have the UN habitat there, amongst others, uh, being uh, uh, stationed in, uh, in, in Nairobi. Uh, and that uh, the government of President uh, uh, Rutu will uh, see to it that the country is uh, seen as a respectable and uh, valued uh, partners by the international community that it will promote friendly relations with its neighbors and uh, playing a leading role uh, in regional and pan African uh, affairs. Uh, they've uh, specifically mentioned, you know, issues around peace and security in their in their neighborhood as one of their foreign policy uh, uh, priorities. Can we move to the next one? And incidentally, before. Uh, Talking on this uh, on this slide, uh, subsequent to his inauguration, he appointed uh, former President uh, Uhuru Kenyatta uh, uh, to continue with the role that he had played in mediating the various conflicts in the in the region, including uh, the recently you know uh, erupted uh, conflict in the Eastern DRC, uh, as well as the challenges and in, in uh, or the civil war in in Ethiopia. Uh, so, President uh, Rutu has uh, asked, uh, uh, and from what we have 
had that the former president has agreed to, to continue saving in those uh, in those rooms. And finally, in terms of the their manifestos, they identified the following pillars uh, in their foreign policy. Uh, one was economic and commercial uh, diplomacy to pursue this uh, vigorously, uh, and that to use Kenya's role as a partner to strengthen its voice in local and continental affairs. Uh, to engage uh, their uh, diaspora uh, with the view of uh, trying to, you know, uh, get some value from from what the Kenyans and the diaspora uh, have, uh, being a good global uh, citizen, uh, which include, you know, supporting the work of uh, international organizations uh, and the treaties that they have signed, uh, and that uh, in its outlook uh, in terms of uh, uh, global affairs, that it will be uh, more of a pan-Africanist uh, uh, stance uh, that will uh, pursue or focus on causes uh, that will improve the situation of, uh, of the African continent. Uh, uh, something that we, we share with them. Uh, and if we can just uh, go to the last slide uh, and really to uh, restate uh, how we see uh, from Diko's point of view, uh, our relations uh, ensuing with, uh, with the new administration. Uh, first uh, is that it should be recalled that uh, we hosted two uh, uh, bilateral mechanisms with, uh, with Kenya towards the end of last year. We had uh, uh, a joint commission for cooperation uh, in August, uh, 2021, which was hosted by Kenya. And then on the 22nd to the 23rd of November, uh, uh, President, uh, former President Uhuru, or President Uhuru, uh, paid a state visit to, to South Africa, which was uh, very successful in our, in our view. Uh, so we looking at uh, ensuring that the decisions and the agreements that were signed uh, during those two events uh, are, are implemented. We have a matrix in the department uh, uh, that we share with the, with the various uh, departments that participate uh, and we continuously monitor uh, the implementation of those, uh, of those uh, decisions that we take. Uh, one of the things which is important for our economic uh, diplomacy and, and really responding you know, to some of the socioeconomic challenges facing South Africa, including unemployment is uh, uh, working uh, hard to increase our trade uh, with uh, with uh, with Kenya uh, currently they are our biggest uh, trading partner uh, on the continent outside of SADC uh, so if you exclude uh, uh, the SADC countries Kenya is our leading uh, trading partner uh, the trade is uh, skewed like in many other african countries in favor of uh, of South Africa, and this issue was uh, strongly uh, raised by President Kenyatta. As a result, there was a decision to uh, for the two countries to work towards uh, uh, leveling the, the trade uh, figures. Uh, and then one of the ways of doing so is, uh, you know, our continued investment in uh, in Kenya. South Africa has a, a good uh, footprint uh, of companies that are invested in Kenya, and we seek to uh, to increase that. Uh, uh, that footprint. Uh, also uh, seek to cooperate with Kenya in promoting uh, good uh, governance and, and democracy on the on the continent. Uh, uh, when we were in in, in 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 Kenya during the JCC, there was an idea muted and is uh, still under very early stages of uh, of of development. Is having you know, a group of seven or eight African countries that can champion these uh, causes and others uh, on, on, on the continent, uh, but it's still at early stages of conceptualization. And then we will also seek to encourage the new administration, you know, to also assert and, uh, and, and protect, you know, the principles of the, uh, the founding principles of the African Union. Uh, which uh, I encountered, uh, I encountered, you know, on Pan-Africanism, which we also espouse as, uh, as South Africa. And uh, as we speak now, there is possibility that there could be 
uh, a state visit to, to Kenya very soon. We're just uh, waiting to conclude the, uh, the discussions around, uh, around the dates, uh, which is important for us to consolidate the work that we had started with, uh, with the administration of uh, President uh, Uhur Kenyatta. Uh, and that will be the end of our presentation. Uh, and, and thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairperson, the honorable members, uh, Deputy Minister uh, Portes, uh, Ambassador Romo, and, uh, and the colleagues. Uh, I thought the chair was back. Thanks very much uh, uh, for the presentation. And uh, I have uh, requested that the DG, acting DG will uh, allow you to present as he has, as he has lined you up uh, so that we won't have these interactions uh, from after one presentation, then the other one once has completed they ask then the other ones can join <clears throat> and then uh, we can then uh, enter the discussion. So acting TG, can we have you <clears throat> allowing us uh, or calling the other presenter uh, to uh, do the presentation uh, on Angola and, uh, and uh, the Sutu and then we'll then uh, take a discussion after all those presentations have been concluded. Over to you, uh, DG. But uh, what is back, then they uh, can then take over. But I think he's still uh, experiencing uh, some natural challenges. So over to you. Uh, where are the other presenters? Good morning, members. I'm, I'm here. Um, I, I see acting. Can you hear me? Online. Yes. Yes. Uh, acting PG, please. Let us okay. not have this interface. Oh, eh? Honorable Chairperson, I'm, I'm sorry, we seem to have a problem with connection. If you allow uh, me to call Mr. Chabani to present, please, on Angola and Lesotho. Thank you. Okay, okay. thanks very much, Acting TG. Thanks. Mr. Chabani. Sorry for thank you, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, good morning, Honorable Members, Deputy Minister. Acting DG colleagues, um, as indicated, my name is Kazamla Chawan. I'm just going to give a, a presentation on the election outcomes of Angola, as well as the state of readiness uh, with regard to the upcoming elections uh, in Lesotho. Uh, what we have on the screen uh, is the political map of Angola, just to give a sense of the length and breadth of the of the country, but also to to give a sense in terms of the extent to which the observer mission had to be stretched throughout the country to conduct its uh, observation. So we can move uh, to the next slide. By way of introduction, uh, honorable members, the elections in Angola were held on 24 June. And as I indicated that uh, uh, there was a deployment of observer missions, South Africa participated within the ambit of the SADC electoral observer mission, which is governed by the SADC uh, the revised SADC principles and guidelines uh, governing uh, 
democratic elections uh, in the in the in the region that is very critical because when they make observations some of which we'll get to in the uh, concluding slides they base them on these uh, established principles but in terms of the organization the observer mission is led by the chair of the organ supported by the Troika. In this case, the chair was uh, um, Namibia. And then in terms of the tro other Troika members, South Africa is the outgoing chair, and then Zambia is an incoming chair of the OGA. Now, they were about, not about just to be specific, 12 political parties that uh, contested the elections in Angola. And you would see, uh, in some of the slides that these were very closely contested elections. Uh, the major parties, therefore, were the ruling party, which is the MPLA. Um, and if you allow me to use the term uh, with the major opposition party being uh, UNITA, and then all other small parties uh, to make up the number of 12, and we'll get back to um, the closer contestation when we look at the numbers in terms of the outcomes in the in the following slides. So that is by way of uh, of introduction. If we can move to the next slide, please. Let me just highlight this constitutional and uh, administrative framework. I think it's very critical because in most of, uh, if not all, elections that are contested, the legalities and the legal frameworks tends to be to take central stage. And uh, Angola is not uh, is not immune to this because some of the laws which are there, um, of course, with the constitution being the supreme law, uh, they tend to be uh, contested in terms of their implementation during the elections. And this has happened, and I, I will lift some of them, including the organic law on the media regulatory authority, wherein uh, you will see uh, in one of the uh, contestation that uh, the complaint was that uh, uh, not all parties were granted uh, fair access to the media. There are other laws that deals with uh, the funding of political parties that also came up. I will delve into that uh, when dealing with the actual contestation, but we thought it would be prudent that at least we um, uh, um, highlight the importance of the legal framework in the in the conduct of uh, of elections. Of course, the constitution also provides for the final arbiter in terms of those contestations that normally come up after the elections, particularly those closely contested elections. And this is what has uh, transpired in uh, in Angola, but. Furthermore, it also gives the uh, uh, necessary uh, legal jurisdiction and the mandate to the National uh, uh, Electoral Commission, which conducts the election. That becomes a central board in terms of the conduct of the elections, pre and uh, during and post in terms of the uh, announcement of the results. If we can move to the second, to the next slide, please. Now, very critical with regards to um, Angola, I must just highlight this. Um, one of the things that has happened with these elections, before I get to the issue of voter registration, was that for the first time, they had the participation of the diaspora um, uh, um, citizens, uh, for example, uh, those who reside in South Africa, they voted in Johannesburg, Pretoria, and, uh, and Cape Town. I think they had plus minus 300 uh, registered uh, diasporans in, uh, in, in our country. Of course, due to their history, the largest number of the diaspora would have come from uh, um, Portugal. <clears throat> 
Now, voter, voter registration, which uh, to a certain extent was uh, uh, a contentious issue, and I will, I will indicate why a bit later, um, was done through the collection of data that is uh, obtained from the civil identification data pay, database. Um, the contentious issue was with regard to the diseased people who are not necessarily or automatically rather removed from this database. database. And you will see in part of this uh, presentation how the opposition uh, parties uh, raised uh, this, uh, this, this matter. We are talking about a country of uh, um, an estimated 35 million um, uh, population. Now, a total of 14 million uh, was, was reported to be in the voters' roll. Uh, I think the point that is critical to make in this regard as compared to the 2017 is that there was a, there was a 50% increase in terms of the registered uh, voters, uh, which augurs well with, uh, with the uh, principles of democracy and the, the, the active uh, participation by the citizens of, uh, of Angola. Now, just to make the point uh, with regard to the deceased people, the estimation, as I've indicated earlier, stood at around 2 million of the names uh, that find their way into, into, the, into the voters role. And this, this put the uh, Electoral Commission, in our view, in a, uh, it exposes them into a position of uh, vulnerability in terms of challenges, challenges from the parties that uh, participate in the, in the election. Now, during the election day, what the observer mission did was to deploy, uh, you would have seen the length and breadth as we demonstrated on the red map, 201 uh, observers uh, uh, in 12 provinces. And then they were able to observe the opening, uh, the voting and the closing and the counting procedures as well in terms of the organic law on general elections. This is one of the laws that uh, were highlighted in, the, in, in, in slide two and made the point that it's important just to keep it in mind as we will continue to refer to some of these legislative frameworks. If we can move to the next slide, please. Just to indicate, honorable members, that uh, of course it was not only um, the SADC observer mission that was deployed there. There were other uh, election observers, including the African Union electoral observer mission. And then, uh, unsurprisingly, the community of the Portuguese-speaking countries. And then we also had the SADC Parliamentary Forum. Uh, we also had the SADC Election Commission Forum, uh, International Conference on the Great Lakes. Um, and then the former presidents, Chisano and Kukweta, as the international observers, they were also part of the contingent that went to observe the elections in Angola. So it was quite a number of observer missions. We front-loaded the SADC observer missions because as I indicated, South Africa, as a member of SADC, uh, was part of that observer mission. We took note that uh, political parties indeed were allowed to submit names of their um, uh, fraternal uh, foreign organizations to be invited by the, um, by the electoral commission to observe the elections. And what was also uh, quite uh, interesting is that in terms of the local observers, the limitation of course to the 2000, but party agents were unlimited uh, 
but this is also a, a bit contentious. In, in other instances, experience has shown that you can have unlimited uh, party agents, but deployment also depends on the, on the funding. So you may have all the um, parties uh, uh, being granted uh, uh, allowance to get to all polling stations, but uh, resource-wise, it, it, it becomes a data mining factor. If we can move to the next slide, please. If we can move to the next slide, please. <clears throat> Now, what the SADC observer mission uh, observed uh, critical is that during the pre-election and the post-election phases, of course, the, 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 there was peace and then uh, this was commendable to all stakeholders uh, because they respected the, the rule of law. And then the political, I mean, contestants, uh, um, of course, followed the due processes in resolving some of the post-election disputes that I will talk to, which includes um, invoking some of the uh, uh, legal frameworks. Of course, concerns were raised uh, by some stakeholders that funds were released late into the campaign processes. This would have been uh, contrary to um, to the organic law on general elections uh, on funding of political parties. The mission, of course, also noted that uh, there were concerns regarding the organization and the functioning of the electoral commissions. And I've already opened, I've already uh, indicated that uh, some of these occurrences uh, uh, opens the electoral commission to questioning of its, of its independence and uh, to a certain extent uh, uh, capacity. I also highlighted the use and the access of public media by all parties because concerns were raised that uh, this was not uh, fairly done. Another concern was with regard to the compilation of the voters' role, which was not published ahead of the elections as per the organic law, which I also referred to in my introductory remarks. Now, despite the system that they had, they call it an SMS system to verify voting registrations. Um, it was said that not all voters made use of that particular system. I think they had a, a challenge with uh, with the system, but that as it may, um, if we can move to the next slide, <clears throat> but that as it may, um, the, the, the preliminary statement which was issued by the SADC Observer Mission on uh, 26 August, uh, uh, well noted again that the phases both pre and post elections were, were, were peaceful and, uh, and commended all stakeholders. Now, on 29 August, the Electoral Commission released the final results uh, and declared the MPLA, the ruling party, the winner with just over 51%, uh, uh, with the opposition party, the main opposition, UNITA, uh, that gained just over 43%. Uh, uh, in the in the in the in the elections, and this was massive for UNITA if one was to compare it with uh, the 2017 elections, where I think they garnered uh, below 30 uh, percent of the vote, and the remaining over four percent of the votes were shared amongst uh, uh, small parties. Uh, now we have seen this phenomenon in other countries whereby once elections uh, elections results are released, some members of the electoral commission tend to uh, absorb themselves, distance themselves. In, in the case of Angola, 
four members of the Electoral Commission who alleged, uh, ally, alleged to be aligned to UNETA. Um, I'm, I'm carefully using the, words, uh, the word alle alleged, uh, distanced themselves from the announced results. Now, the resultant action by UNITA was to lodge a petition to the Constitutional Court, which it, of course we referred to earlier, uh, calling for, among other things, the recount of the pilot, citing several discrepancies in terms of the tallying of the outcomes. Well, the the court on 8 September uh, rejected the petition and, uh, and made the pronunciation that uh, in dismissing the UNITA uh, petition, uh, they were upholding the outcome of the election, which therefore meant that uh, uh, President Lorenzo would have won uh, the second term and uh, as such, was uh, uh, inaugurated on 15 September 2022, of which we we attended as uh, as South Africa. If we can move to the next slide, please. Just to make a summative conclusion, um, in terms of the revised SADAC principles uh, that governs elections, uh, we have indicated that the chair of the organ um, leads the, 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 the election observer, of course, supported by the Troika. Now, as the responsibility to present a consolidated report with the lessons learned observations, I've spoken to that, and the recommendations that they would have made to the government of Angola. The expectation, therefore, is that uh, the SADC Electoral Advisory Council shall return to Angola at an appropriate time to undertake a post-election uh, review with the aim to determine the extent to which the recommendation of the observer mission have been implemented. Honorable members would have noted some of those concerns as I highlighted in part of the presentation. The nature of support that Angola may require, if any, uh, from the SADC region to, uh, to implement the, the proposals and the recommendations to improve the electoral process in future. So that concludes the short presentation on Angola. Uh, Chair, I will also very quickly delve into the readiness of the Kingdom of Lesotho hold elections in October, starting, of course, with uh, uh, the political uh, uh, landscape, just to give a sense of uh, where we are going to deploy as SADAC uh, in terms of the voting district and in the length and the breadth of the mountain kingdom. Can we go to the next slide, please? As provided by the Constitution of Lesotho, King Litsi uh, uh, declared the 7th of October as the date for the holding of the National Assembly elections uh, in, the, in the kingdom. And uh, in a subsequent action, the Independent Electoral Commission therefore announced the election roadmap spanning from July to early October 2022. Now, we have noticed, and we'll come back to this in some parts of the, um, of the presentation, that there's been a, a massive increase in political parties from 27 that contested the 2017 elections to 65 in 2022. As demonstrated in the uh, uh, roadmap, there are 10 voting uh, districts, uh, which are subdivided into 80 electoral constituencies, which consist, of course, of 129 community local councils. If we can move to the next one, please. The same way that we 
we felt it was necessary to deal with the uh, uh, legislative frameworks with regard to Angola. Um, we felt it would be necessary to highlight this uh, uh, with regard to Lesotho, particularly taking into consideration that Lesotho has been in the process with the assistance of SADC of trying to effect certain reforms which uh, Deputy Minister spoke to in his opening uh, remarks and the implications thereof, um, which I'm not going to, to repeat, but suffice to say, they are still using the 1993 constitution and then the electoral law that dates back to 2011. Uh, perhaps if there were the reforms or the omnibus bill would have been passed, uh, we'll be talking um, a different uh, a different story. However, this is the law that is in force, and it entrusts both government and the two chambers of the Senate National Assembly and the Senate that consists of 33 nominated members, 22 principal chiefs. As you know, that Lesotho is the is the the the, 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 the mountain kingdom. 11 other members appointed by the ruling uh, party, whereas the National Assembly has got a membership of 120, with eight members voted through a plurality of votes, four of whom are voted on by political parties. And this is what is going to apply, as I've indicated that the, the reforms were not concluded. Suffice to indicate that all qualifying parties as provided by the law have signed the electoral code of conduct in terms of how they are going to abide to the provisions of such a code in terms of the constitutional requirements. If we can move to the next slide, please. Now, in terms of voter registrations, uh, this process is said to have intensified from May 2021 and then closed on 31 July 2022. We are talking of an estimated uh, voting uh, age of about 800,000 to 900,000 persons in Lesotho. And there was a notable increase in youth registration, uh, which is uh, attributed to voter education by the Electoral uh, Commission and, and, the, and the relevant stakeholders. And it's a commendable uh, progress. The, the IEC conducted nomination of candidates on 9 uh, September 2022 in all constituencies that we referred to earlier on. What they call advanced voting uh, will take place on 30 uh, September 2022, uh, according to, to, to the plan, uh, which is uh, this coming Friday, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, this coming Friday. Uh, just as a reminder, the application for the advanced voting took place from 12 to 16 September 2022, so it has been uh, concluded. If we can move to the next slide, please. If we can move to the next slide, please. Now, honorable members, the, the government of Lesotho is the one that has been uh, releasing funds to the IEC um, in, 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 in what I will call the trenches. Uh, but the budget for the elections, it's estimated at 498 million. And so far, only 261.5 million has been released or allocated by parliament. 
So they didn't give them the complete, I mean, the, the whole amount, but they opted to give it to them in pages. So one can only hope that uh, the, remind, the remainder of the amount will be available to ensure um, that the elections are a success. However, government keep on saying that they are ready, so we should not worry much. I'm hoping that there won't be a last minute uh, a surprise where uh, the IEC will be expected uh, with the assistance of government to scramble for additional resources. However, the IEC remain in close discussion with the state uh, budget control in that matter. And the, and, the, and the Auditor General um, in the event that there are certain shortfalls discussing the extent to which this could be uh, covered. On the security front, uh, the IEC has launched the, what they call the National Joint Operations Center that comprises of the Lesotho Defense Force, the Lesotho Mounted Police, the National Security Service, as well as ministries of foreign affairs and international relations and the ministry of, um, of home affairs. Uh, this will be some sort of a, a control room um, just to ensure that the elections uh, take place without uh, the major glitches. Now, as a, as a practice and as a norm, um, international observers have been um, invited. We are going to participate within the ambit of SADC the same way that we did the, uh, in Angola. It's practically the same way that we have always done in uh, other countries in the region. The AU, the EU, the Commonwealth, and the USA have also confirmed their availability to uh, observe the elections. If we can move to the next slide, please. If we can move to the next one, please. <clears throat> Honorable members, just to take you through the um, few challenges that we we think uh, 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 are critical. I've already indicated this massive increase from 2017 um, uh, parties that participated in the elections, which were 27 to 65 in 2022, that our view is that it may uh, present logistical uh, challenges associated mainly with the printing and transportation of the election ballots across the, the country. This, this may as well be compounded by the fact that um, some roads and bridges were destroyed during uh, heavy rains between October 2021 and, um, and March 2022. But there tends to be continued assurance that uh, the IEC would be able to deliver despite this uh, uh, natural uh, uh, challenge. In terms of the pre-election -assess assessment, which was made by SADEG in May, this transportation of ballots was highlighted and it was noted that perhaps it would be important for the southern countries to remain on alert because even if uh, the IEC says it's ready to avoid the last minute disappointment, it's really, really important and as recommended by SADEC that countries should be available to release helicopters that could assist the Lesotho uh, Defense Force should their uh, support be required. And as I've indicated, the Lesotho Defense Force itself has <laughs> confirmed its readiness to transport uh, uh, ballots to voting station across the country. So uh, we hope that will be the case, but 
necessarily will need to be uh, on alert. But so far, there hasn't been any request that has come through to any of the SADC member states uh, individually or collectively. Uh, if we can move to the next slide, please. The issue of budget, um, I've indicated honorable members how these monies have been uh, dispatched in trenches, uh, but of course it has been flagged as a concern. Uh, it's also a very worrisome uh, phenomenon of crime, uh, which is perpetuated by the so-called uh, farmer gangs. Uh, these are gangs that are involved in uh, cross-border crime, including illegal mining, who would know better about this. But they also operate within the borders of uh, Lesotho. That's why in the recent past, there's been a spike in the um, acts of criminality. And this will need the full operation of the enforcement agencies to maintain law and order and the joint operation set that I referred to earlier will be central in ensuring that uh, this is taken care of. We have also noted with concern, and this has been going on for some time, food shortages uh, within uh, nine of the, uh, the, the 10 districts uh, in Lesotho. I know, of course, that uh, for, for some years now, the Lesotho has been prone to food insecurity. Um, but the good news perhaps is that this um, process that uh, the BRICS uh, bank in consultation with other stakeholders is undertaking to see how they can assist Lesotho in the area of agriculture so that they reach a stage of food uh, security but so far where we are now that is the situation there's an acute food security problem challenge in the in the suit if we can move to the next slide please very few observations that we have made uh, i'm not going to repeat the first one because the deputy minister spoke to this uh, with regard to the amendment uh, bill, the omnibus bill, which could not be uh, concluded uh, despite the recall of uh, uh, parliament to try and pass the bill through a state of emergency, which by the way was declared unconstitutional by the constitutional court. As where we are sitting now, we are, uh, governed in terms of the electoral process by the 1993 constitution. If we can move to the next slide, please. Of course, the implications of the High Court ruling is that Lesotho will go to the elections with, without having enacted the said reforms as the deputy minister has indicated. Um, one would hope that uh, following the conclusion of the elections, uh, Basutu will uh, find it amongst themselves to urgently uh, uh, go back to the reform process and see how they can finalize with the assistance, of course, of SADAC. And you will recall that South Africa uh, was key in um, uh, uh, facilitating these reforms. And uh, they are very close to finality. And it would make a, a sense that whoever wins the election, the incoming government will take it upon itself to uh, finalize the reforms. If we can move to the next slide which I suspect is the last slide. Thank you so much, uh, um, Chairperson, uh, Honorable uh, Members, Deputy Minister, and uh, Acting DG and colleagues. I will stop there. Thank you so much.
thank you uh, honorable chairperson okay and Perfect. and uh, um dm Bortis. uh that's the presentation from dico i'm not sure if we can hand over to you now for for answers and comments please okay no thanks very much uh, uh acting tg and thanks very much uh, to all the presenters uh, starting uh, with the opening remarks of uh, the DM, uh, Honorable uh, Bortes. Uh, I saw you on the television, uh, Honorable Bortes, uh, but I won't say where, uh, with Minister Mandashe. <laughs> That's just on a lighter note. <clears throat> and then, Ubabu uh, Chabane, uh, uh, for the presentation that he is uh, just concluded now. Uh, I think it was Ubabu uh, Tlomo, who also did the presentation <coughs> on Kenya. Uh, honorable members, uh, the chair has asked that I proceed with chairing. Uh, now the opportunity is for us to engage uh, with the presentation. Uh, the one that deals with Kenya and Angola and uh, also uh, the coming elections uh, in Lesotho. So I will uh, give this opportunity uh, to honorable members, but maybe before I do that, I just want to check something also on my side. Uh, just uh, be patient with me, uh, honorable members. Okay, because there's something that I want to check here with the department, which I think uh, uh, it will assist if, yeah. I wanted the department also to, in their response, uh, to also brief us on what President Ruto, Dr. Ruto, uh, said on the Western Sahara matter, because it's important uh, to be brief on that one, because. Uh, I think he did say something, and I think it will uh, enlighten us uh, and then uh, put us uh, to understanding as to what is Kenya's position on such matters. Uh, but uh, without wasting any time, let me allow honorable members uh, to engage uh, with the discussions or the presentations. Uh, I don't see any hands uh, on my platform, but members can also shout uh, and then uh, we can just allow them to uh, engage and uh, ask questions of clarity, make inputs uh, or comments. Over to you, honorable members. I see the hand of uh, honorable Ngozi, uh, of Reverend Mshweu, uh, so far, those are the hands that I see. Uh, I think let me allow uh, <clears throat> those two honorable members uh, the opportunity. And then will be followed by Ubabu uh, Mshwe. No, thanks, Jefferson. I, I, I think we should appreciate the detailed inputs on Kenya, Angola, and uh, Lesotho. I just want to make the following comments. Firstly, is that it may be important that uh, the committee is briefed even prior to the elections themselves, particularly on the state of readiness uh, of uh, countries to hold elections, the role of the uh, monitoring groups, um, particularly the, in, in the SADC group, so that we are able to, uh, on time, determine whether we should ask to be part of uh, uh, observer missions or to influence observer missions to focus on particular issues. I think the, the, the second thing is that we are seeing in the region a consolidation of uh, democracy and, and democratically elected governments taking over. 
it is notable that uh, you know uh, in the past uh, Kenya was associated with a lot of violence pre and post elections, but uh, it is a welcome thing that um, in these elections they, they, there has been none or minimal uh, reportage of such. Uh, the other point Jay, is that I would like to know from the department the the role that Kenya plays in that region uh, in relation to stabilization. I, I have noted that the president uh, has given uh, uh, um, Uhuru Kenyatta, former president, the responsibility to engage at an international level in terms of uh, stabilizing the region. But I think the matters are much deeper than that. We know that the instability in TRC affects most of uh, uh, countries involved in that area. So it may be important to reflect on what Kenya does to ensure that there is uh, stability. Secondly, in relation to that is the relationship between Kenya and ourselves as a country. Um, I think we, we have hosted bi-nationals or whatever uh, in the past and uh, democratization in both countries should lead to increased levels of engagement at, at trade uh, and economic uh, relations. So I'd like to have a comment on, on, on that. Um, the other general point uh, relates to the, the role played by parliamentarians uh, pre and post, uh, particularly the, 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 this body that sits here in Midrand, the African parliament, uh, the AU parliament. I mean, what role do they play? How do they brief bodies like us on dynamics, on, on, on what they're doing as a body? to consolidate democracy and how they encourage uh, multipartyism and uh, the holding of free and fair elections and, and tolerance. As far as this is concerned, Chairperson, I think, um, yeah, the, the impact of uh, instability in successive governments in Lesotho affects our country. Uh, and affects uh, uh, in, in particular our country, but also is a concern for 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 SADC. And safe to say that the the constitutional reforms are welcomed and have been a result of a protracted, engaged and uh, uh, at times fractious uh, process. I think we should welcome the fact that at least those are uh, before parliament and they will be tabled and if adopted will guide uh, future elections in, in Lesotho. Uh, what I hope for is that they, they should not be a, a, a pulling out or a disengagement either at bilateral level or through SADC uh, bodies uh, to ensure that uh, Lesotho returns to stability. Otherwise, Chair, I think I welcome the inputs. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Ngosi. Uh, Honorable uh, uh, Mishwe. Uh, Honorable Mpanza is Honorable Mishwe, not Mishwe Wu. OK. Thank you. <laughs> Please. Bye. Finally, honorable <laughs> Finally. I, I, I thought along the line you will catch up from yeah. other members, you know, but the realize we're not catching up. So it's me, I say. <laughs> hey, you make honorable cause to be very excited. <laughs> <laughs> Over to you, Reverend. Okay, sir. Thank you. Um, a few questions of clarity, sir. Um, Mr. Odinga filed a lawsuit challenging the outcome of the elections. And one of his um, reasons for challenging them was um, the fact that their constitution, um, they give a threshold of 50% plus one vote. Now, the outcome of the election did not give the incumbent 
50% plus one. And yet the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Dr. William Ruto. What I want to know from this is how the Supreme Court uh, justified uh, giving a unanimous ruling, even though the threshold was not attained. And the second question uh, is about the Lesotho elections. Okay, we heard that um, for the National Assembly, 80 members are voted through plurality votes. I want to confirm, is this plurality vote, does this plurality vote mean um, votes of the general population or what does that mean? And secondly, they are talking about 40 members who are voted on by political parties. Can we get the explanation of how this happens? Uh, how do you vote for political parties compared to the plurality votes? And when we look at the Senate, the Senate consists of 33 nominated members. It's nominated, are those nominated not voted on? And if yes, by who? Um, is it the general public or by who? And why do they say 33 nominated and not voted or elected members? And when it comes to the 22 principal chiefs, is it that, okay, how do they, how do they conclude on the number 22? Are the chiefs that are elected to the Senate appointed by government or the public has anything to do with this? And are the principal chiefs only in 22 in number in Lesotho or how do they decide on the 22? And then um, the 11 other members are appointed by the ruling party. Obviously, this gives the ruling party an advantage over other political parties. Do they appoint from their members? And uh, has, it, has this practice been going on unchallenged by members of the public or members of other political parties? And um, lastly, when it comes to the IEC, we see that the IEC, the IEC, some members of the IEC distance, distance themselves from the results. And this seems to be a practice in Kenya and, and, and Angola. Um, at least in South Africa, we have never had um, members of the public of the IEC distancing themselves because this has a, this has a, the potential of undermining the credibility of the, the election results. So I want to understand whether this is a normal practice that is accepted that other IEC officials can distance themselves when those they favor uh, are not uh, winning or what could be the basis of this? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Reverend. Uh, yes, uh, I don't see any other hands. <clears throat> yeah, but I, I just want also to add uh, to uh, the, the, the question, uh, beside the one that I, I posed earlier on of getting a briefing. <clears throat> um, I think the honorable members have uh, asked quite a lot and I'm covered. But uh, if we can just also be, uh, just be provided by comparative analysis of the electoral system that both uh, or these three 
countries are using, particularly Kenya and, um, and Angola uh, with our electoral system. Why I'm asking that, uh, I'm sure you are aware, uh, Etching DG and your team, that uh, <clears throat> we have been also be ordered by the Constitutional Court uh, to do some amendments in our own <clears throat> electoral uh, system and the parliament is in the process <clears throat> of doing that so that at least there can be some maybe lessons that one maybe can uh, learn uh, from that, I'm not sure, I might be mistaken, but uh, I also had uh, uh, information whether it was a correct one or maybe it wasn't, but maybe you can uh, enlighten us on that one. That uh, I don't know whether it's Kenya, I think it's Kenya, it's, uh, they just have uh, electoral that covers all uh, spheres of government. Because uh, <clears throat> if that is the case, and uh, there is uh, Kenya uh, conducting their elections in that fashion and it's successful, uh, that's another lesson that uh, we can also learn because uh, there's also a debate, uh, I'm sure everyone, it's a public knowledge uh, within the different <clears throat> political parties and other stakeholders of also uh, going that route of synergizing uh, our <clears throat> uh, elections into one. So uh, those are the few uh, points that I would want to you maybe to uh, enlighten us on. Uh, and then uh, <clears throat> please, uh, Acting DG, you will guide us as to how uh, the questions and the comments that have been made by honorable members, including myself, uh, are going to be responded to. Uh, over to you, Acting DG. Thank you, thank you very much, Honorable Mpanza. Um, Thank you uh, very much uh, to the members for their for their uh, questions. I will suggest that, and I'm not sure. Um, um, DM Botes will also indicate when he wants to come in. I will suggest that we start uh, with Ambassador Bungane, uh, as he has started and follow uh, the the process through. And please, Ms. Ambassador Bungane, follow uh, the questions that have been. Uh, as they have been asked. And if there's anything which is outstanding, outstanding we'll then come back again and, and deal with that. Ambassador Pungani. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. DG and, uh, and the honorable members uh, and Deputy Minister of Protest uh, uh, I'll need assistance where I missed some of the questions, but uh, the first one uh, by the acting chair on uh, Dr. Ruto's uh, tweet on Western Sahara. Uh, the tweet was subsequently uh, removed uh, because in the tweet, uh, uh, President Ruto had uh, indicated that they were de-recognizing uh, Western Sahara as a, as a state. It was a brief uh, uh, tweet, and uh, I don't know whether it was in the tweet itself, uh, but there had been some uh, a brief or a meeting between the uh, delegation of of more. So I'm not sure whether the, you know, I, I can't recall it. the leader of the delegation from Morocco had had with uh, President uh, Ruto. But of importance uh, is that uh, a day later, uh, the permanent secretary, uh, 
uh, or the, not the, is the principal sector is an equivalent of, uh, of, of DG in our jurisdiction, uh, issued uh, a statement, the media statements to all missions uh, uh, and, and other people uh, to clarify uh, Kenya's stance. Uh, and I'll just refer to some of the paragraphs that he, uh, he penned in the, in the letter. One was that uh, Kenya's position on uh, the Sahara-Harawi Arab Democratic uh, Republic is fully aligned with the decision of the Organization of African Unity then to admit uh, uh, the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic as a, a member of the AU in 1982. Uh, and also uh, subsequently aligned with the AU Charter uh, that came into operation uh, when the AU was established. And further, they say the uh, Kenya aligns itself uh, with the UN Security Council resolution. Uh, they mentioned the resolution number, which calls for the self-determination of Western Sahara through a free and fair referendum administered by the UN and the AU. And says Kenya supports the implementation of that. Uh, and then <laughs> made uh, the last remark, uh, the term Principal Secretary then said, uh, it's important to, to be noted that Kenya does not conduct its foreign policy on Twitter or other social media. And therefore the letter serves to clarify uh, Kenya's position with regard to uh, the matter of uh, the Saudi Arab Republic. So, as far, we are con as far as we are concerned, then that concludes the matter. That's the stance of, uh, of Kenya on the, on the matter. There hasn't been any further statements uh, from the presidency or anybody else uh, contradicting what the permanent secretary said. So we take that that is the official position uh, of Kenya. Uh, and the questions from uh, uh, Honorable Member Ngosi on post-electoral violence in Kenya, we concur with that. We are very relieved uh, that these elections uh, went off uh, peacefully. Uh, although there were some you know, observations that uh, if the elections had gone the other way around, uh, there is doubt whether we'll be saying the same thing, but uh, that's academic now. The elections have gone off, uh, peacefully and we are very grateful for, for that because uh, Kenya is a, an important partner for, for South Africa on the continent and in that region in, in particular. And then on the role of Kenya in stabilizing the, the region, uh, I mentioned a few uh, countries uh, and in our engagement with them, we acknowledged uh, the role that they played and that uh, uh, in some instances, will take cue from uh, from them as uh, as an important player uh, in that in that region. Uh, the first one, uh, and this has been long standing, is their development of uh, not development deployment of troop of of troops to Somalia. Uh, and the reason for that are not hard to find. Uh, really, Kenya has uh, suffered. Uh, you know, it's a result of terrorist attacks from the same terrorist group that is uh, terrorizing uh, Kenya. So they have deployed uh, troops in, in Somalia for for a long time under Amazon and the and the latter uh, 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 AU uh, uh, body that is uh, still involved in in, in Somalia. And then, uh, secondly, is on uh, on Ethiopia. We are aware of the. Uh, civil law that have ensued in uh, in uh, in Ethiopia since uh, 2020, 2020 uh, December 2020, if I'm not uh, mistaken, uh, and Kenya has been uh, supporting uh, mediation efforts uh, to try and uh, and. Both uh, sides, you know, of of this uh, 
of this role that Kenya is is playing in the in the background in support of the AU missions, for instance, led by uh, the former president of uh, of uh, of Nigeria, uh, Abasanjo. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I think some of the detail I may not have it uh, with me uh, readily available, but we can share that if it is uh, necessary. So they are very supportive and are playing some role in the background uh, in trying to find peace in uh, in, in Ethiopia. Uh, and the latest efforts really around finding peace appears to be bearing fruit, although uh, not, uh, you know, 100% with uh, TPLF, for instance, uh, signaling their readiness to uh, to to negotiate with the with the Ethiopian uh, federal government uh, uh, so there's some hope uh, there and the last one is the conflict that we also mentioned in the eastern uh, DRC uh, Kenya has also played uh, some role there uh, earlier in the year they hosted a, a summit of the heads of states uh, in the in the region uh, I think in uh, in April uh, there may be a, there may have been a subsequent uh, summit as well, uh, but the summit that uh, was chaired by uh, President Kenyatta uh, uh, led to uh, a decision that uh, the East African Community would deploy troops uh, in Eastern DRC, and some of the countries I know for for a fact that uh, Burundi, for instance, has uh, already uh, deployed some troops uh, in East in East. DRC to try and, uh, and bring peace to uh, that region. Uh, but the conflict is still ongoing, but it doesn't look like it's escalating at the sidelines of the of the UN uh, General Assembly recently. Uh, there was apparently you know, some talks between the two presidents of uh, DRC and, and, uh, and Rwanda, because we, we know that uh, you know, there was a panel, panel of experts uh, of the UN that confirmed uh, Rwanda's involvement uh, in that in that conflict, uh, and obviously they deny that. Uh, but the panel had uh, reached a different uh, decision. And in terms of, uh, I think the on the bilateral relations between South Africa and, and Kenya and the democracy in both countries, and the impact on trade uh, is, is an area really that we working very hard uh, on uh, in terms of increasing our, our trade. Uh, there were some uh, setbacks uh, recently with one or two of our companies divesting from the Kenyan market, but uh, uh, we think that that would not be a trend to be, to, to be followed. Uh, and when we're in, uh, in Nairobi uh, uh, last year, uh, it was one of the decisions that our mission uh, would uh, lead efforts uh, for South Africa to try and under, understand, you know, what could be some of the difficulties that our companies are experiencing. There. We know, uh, like for instance, in the ports, you know, delays in getting our goods offloaded uh, into the ports, uh, etc. To try and uh, and find, you know, solutions to those uh, to those to those challenges, uh, and it is ongoing uh, uh, work. Uh, as Spoke about in the presentation about Kenya's uh, uh, desire for the trade imbalance to to be rectified, and uh, the specific sectors that they thought uh, could uh, could have access to our market and then uh, contribute towards this uh, trade imbalance, the agricultural sector, for instance. So there's work underway to to address those uh, those issues led by the DTIC, uh, and then. Uh, I think the Pan African Parliament, uh, I don't think it's my space. Uh, and then on uh, the question by uh, the Honorable Reverend uh, Mishwe on, uh, on our Dinga, uh, the court ruled uh, that he reached 50% uh, plus one vote. Uh, before the elections, we were not sure in the in the business unit, you know, whether this 50 plus one was it 1% one or one vote, uh, but it looks like it's, uh, it's, it's one vote. Uh, so according to the results that we showed, uh, uh, Dr. Ruto gained 
49%. So in my reading, I think that's what the court uh, based its decision is that it is definitely more than 50%. Uh, but we don't have the uh, detailed uh, court, I don't know whether it is available already, uh, uh, decision on this, including the reasons for their uh, various decisions. Uh, we just have the summary that they released immediately after they made the decision. Uh, we'll try to source the, the original or the, the recent uh, court decision on the, on the matter and share it if it is of, uh, of interest. Uh, and then the by, 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 by the chair, the comparative analysis, I think we may need to be allowed a bit of time. I don't know whether these procedures uh, make provision for, for that. Uh, but uh, one of the obvious uh, 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 differences between our systems uh, is on the elections of the presidents. Theirs is, 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 is direct, uh, uh, whereas uh, uh, so the vote, the, the president get voted by the by the electorate, you know, uh, directly and not through uh, parliament like we we do in our in our instance. Uh, I think on the others, uh, I think we can we can look at uh, whether or not uh, in those instances there are uh, there are further differences. Uh, but I just wanted to, you know, just target the presidential election, which is which can which is of of interest, I suppose, from uh, from 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 our side, and then on the you know the elections taking place covering the various spheres. That's 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 true. That's what happened, uh, and uh, by all accounts, it looks everything went uh, peacefully. How they managed that, I think, I'll be interested in in getting you know behind the scenes of the uh, of of their processes. Uh, but one of the uh, can't say it's in, in innovations, uh, but their voting was done electronically, uh, wholly electronically. Uh, before the elections, there were queries by some of the candidates whether you know the system was going to to cope, uh, and then uh, it delivered uh, the results uh, that were that were announced. Uh, and hence, uh, on the core challenges that were uh, cited uh, by the various, uh, 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 by Dr. Uh, or not Dr. By Mr. Ruto, not Ruto, sorry, Odinga. Uh, one of the things that the court has to determine was the technology that was used, whether it met, you know, the standards uh, that were listed in the in, in the presentation, and they are. Answer was in the in the in the affirmative. Uh, there was also, uh, you know, uh, an issue before the elections that there were uh, some foreign nationals that were found with, uh, you know, with uh, uh, information relating to the to the to the system, uh, but it was also uh, not found to have impacted on the. I think there were some Venezuelans. I don't know whether they have sourced technicians. Or the equipment, uh, but there were some uh, people other than Kenyans who were uh, part of this uh, electronic voter uh, system. Uh, but the court did not find um, anything on toward uh, the. Uh, I don't know what this, uh, yeah, uh, I've tried. Yeah, and then on the whether is the normal this thing of. Commissioners distancing themselves. Uh, yeah, as we reported, both myself and Mr. Chabane, it happened in a, in a, in in Kenya and then in a, I don't know, it's copycatting in, in Angola. Uh, but in Kenya, the these uh, commissioners that distanced themselves uh, were part of the process right up right up until the end or towards the end. Uh, I think it was a result of the two of about 32 constituencies or, or voting stations uh, that they began to have some issues. Uh, and then there was an, a question as to whether legally uh, the president of the, of the electoral uh, commission uh, 
could then proceed uh, and announce the elections uh, uh, with the majority of the councillors, or what is this commissioners having uh, withdrawn from, from the process and the court uh, found that, uh, you know, there was nothing wrong with what the commissioner did uh, because these guys were there uh, throughout the, the process and the electoral commission had, had staff that uh, was managing the process. Uh, the commissioners were overseeing the, the, the process and therefore the work out by these uh, commissioners uh, did not have any material impact on the, on the outcome of the, of the results. Uh, and hence, we are where we are uh, in terms of present, who uh, now being president of, of, of Kenya. Uh, I think I'll end it there, uh, Madam uh, Acting DG. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador uh, Bungane. Um, I think we, we can al uh, allow now Mr. Chabane to come in. And uh, Honorable uh, Banza and members, uh, I'm thinking that the the point you have made and perhaps an instruction to us to do the analysis of the different electoral systems uh, is something which we'll look at and which might have we might have some uh, suggestions uh, on how it can be done with the parliamentary uh, office because it's some research will need to be done. For instance, in terms of the electoral system, uh, Namibia has had an electoral um, an um, electronic system for some time now. So there's a lot which we uh, we can learn in the analysis being assisted by our embassies, but also working with the committee which works uh, supports uh, the committee. If it's okay with you, um, Honorable um, Banza, can I please call Mr. Chabane to come in then and address the rest of the questions? Thank you. Thank you. Um... Acting DG, um, let me just talk to the question that was raised by Honorable Mesh uh, with a preface. Rather that, uh, I think there's an echo somewhere. Okay, yeah, with a with a preface that uh, uh, it also falls within the broader analysis of the electoral system. Um, one, we need to appreciate that uh, Lesotho has got a very unique system. Uh, unique system in the sense that, as we all know, the, the kingship is hereditary. And there are certain powers which are vested in the king uh, by the College of Chiefs, including the constitution in terms of nominating a particular number of people who can sit in the in the in the in, in parliament after elections. Be that as it may, uh, for instance, the monarch has the right to nominate uh, approximately 11 uh, members. Um, I, I don't have the specific number, but approximately 11 members uh, uh, to serve a five-year period in the, in the Senate. And then uh, 22 members there about who serve in the Senate, uh, they are called the hereditary. I don't know who. Now, the plurality uh, vote, maybe it must be looked at uh, within this uh, unique mixed member proportional representative system that Lesotho uses. That I must confess, we also need to study very closely to speak with, uh, with authority in, uh, in how the, 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 the tires therefore work, because you have for the first and the secondary time 
But what I can try and explain is that under that system, you get two ballots on election day. One that is used for a nominal uh, tire candidate. Second is for a party list tire candi candidate. And then the list of those ballots are used to determine the number of seats each party would receive. Uh, in the, depending on uh, the, the, the proportionality. So it's a bit of a complicated system. And the allocation of seats is also done within a system that is called uh, a Hare quarter. It's a sort of a variation system <clears throat> whereby a total number of votes cast on a political party is divided by the total number of the seats that are that are at stake or rather available in the National Assembly. That's why we speak about that uh, 120 uh, thereabout. Um, and then the plurality voting, which is, uh, I don't think it's unique to Lesotho. It's done at uh, constituency level where people will be either vote for one or the other candidate. Um, and I'm told that previously it would cause confusion, even to Basotho themselves, that uh, in some elections, those votes would be disregarded and uh, uh, the king would have to <laughs> intervene so it's a it's, it's really a very uh, uh, unique but also complicated uh, uh, system perhaps to put it into more context <laughs> the the need for reforms as well uh, were to address some of these gaps in terms of the electoral systems hence i kept on um, emphasizing that as things stand, we are still governed by the previous constitution. And we hope that as they are in the cusp of reforms, they would be able to do so, so that it guides them to future elections. There are traditional leaders who have got a certain quarter in the Senate or either the Senate or cabinet uh, who, who, who must sit there uh, by virtue of them being traditional leaders. So their system is different, completely different from us. And uh, let me just really, as I've confessed, I, I can't answer the question sufficiently because it needs thorough research and analysis, but for now I can make those uh, those comments, uh, 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 Chair and the, and the acting DG. Thank you very much. Can I give it over to you? Because I can see other hands uh, on our side. Uh, we think we've covered what has been um, raised so far. Thank you, sir. OK. No, thanks very much. Yes, I can see two hands. Uh, Honorable Meshu uh, and the Honorable Faber. But let me start with Honorable Faber, because uh, the Reverend, I think, is a second bite. No, no, it's not a second uh, bite, it's a follow-up, sir. Oh, it's a follow-up. Okay, yeah. no, it's fine. But uh, let me allow uh, Honorable Fiber, then you'll make a follow-up. And then uh, we'll hear the response uh, from the department. Honorable Panza, Honorable Fiber, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Honorable Fab. Yes, Honorable Pons, I would rather let um, Honorable Meshri, Reverend Meshri, um, ask his follow-up. Um, I need something clarity on for, with this Foreign Services Unit, um, just actually not on this presentation. So, um, I, but it's very important to this specific portfolio of ours. 
And that's why I'd rather let Honorable Meshwe finish his, and then I would like to raise my point if possible. Okay, granted. Uh, over to you, uh, Honorable Meshwe. Uh, thanks, Honorable Faba. Um, obviously, some questions were, were, were not answered, and I understand that uh, Mr. Chabani did say he's not sure about uh, uh, how to answer some questions. So I would really like to have a commitment from the from the acting DG that they will research and come back to this committee with answers. Because um, when one looks at the Senate again, you see that 11 other members are appointed by the ruling party, which is very strange. And I really want to know the rationale behind that because it definitely gives the ruling party an advantage over all other parties. So I would really appreciate a commitment that they are going to research, they're going to find out, and they will come back to this committee with answers. Thank you, Chairperson, acting Chairperson. Thank you, thank you, Honorable uh, Reverend. I think let us make that uh, as uh, our resolution as a committee that uh, because that question of a comparative analysis is, uh, is brought and they came here not uh, prepared and it will need some uh, work in terms of researching that uh, when they are ready, they can liaise with the, the committee secretary and the chair and then uh, come and bring it back because I think uh, it will uh, very much uh, assist us and, and reach us, you know. We are now living in a technological time and digital times. Now, even the issue of electronic, uh, you know, counting, I think it's a matter that uh, also uh, is being also debated in some quarters. So uh, I think let us make that uh, as a, a resolution of this committee that uh, when they are ready, uh, through uh, their facilitation, of coming back through the committee secretary and the chairperson of the portfolio committee, they will then bring a, that a report. Uh, Honorable Fiber, over to you, sir. Thank you, Honorable Ponza. Honorable Ponza, yes, um, as we have the Foreign Services Unit online, um, I needed to bring something up that occurred in the last two, three days, which is very important, and I do believe we cannot, as an international relations portfolio committee, just sit aside and keep quiet on this. We have to discuss this, and specifically while we have them here. Now, you know, the Foreign Services Unit is there to ensure electrical, um, electoral integrity, as we heard, Honorable Panza. And, um, you know, the, the actual scary part was when we heard um, that in Ukraine at the moment, um, that the ANC Youth League have sent observers and actually to go to a, a unlawful, um, what we call referendum as observers. Now, I, I need to know, is the Foreign Services Unit of South Africa going to take steps upon this? Because the integrity of South Africa is all of a sudden on the roll here. Um, we've seen now that Ukraine is actually taking uh, further steps on that um, to make a case. And I need to know, um, you know, what is South Africa going to do about this? It's putting us in such a bad state at this moment. You know, what I'm just worried about is last week we had Professor Zondi um, informing us, I think it's one of the most informative sessions um, in my, let's say, 12 years on international relations in Parliament, where he was talking about that, uh, what we sometimes call silent diplomacy, where governments in other parts of um, parties or um, departments to actually um, do things which is not seen to be done by government or the minister, but instead helping. Now, now I'm quite concerned because 
is it then also maybe that the ANC government have sent the ANC Youth League by trying to keep them um, away as culprits and to give legitimacy to Russian illegal occupancy and referendums in Ukraine? Because chairperson, as this portfolio committee, I, I don't think we can just look aside and, and let this go. Um, we have to take this up. And, and I want to know from Dirk and Forest Services Unit, and especially with Deputy Minister Alvin Puertas, what is our government going to do about this situation our country finds itself in at this stage? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, lucky Honorable Nola is not here. Uh, <laughs> uh, Honorable Gosi. Order, please. Uh, no, oh, thanks very much, uh, Honorable Father. Uh, but uh, let me first of all uh, express this. Uh, we had uh, I, I, items, agendas uh, <clears throat> before us. Uh, and we were dealing with those uh, presentations that were dealing with those three countries. And uh, I don't uh, prevent you to take an opportunity to ask uh, the acting DG and the DM if they are in a position to answer that. But we <clears throat> we, we we are not uh, going to be dealing with uh, such matters, and uh, so it is up to them. I will leave uh, it to them uh, to whether they are in a position to respond or not to respond uh, in whatever way uh, they decide. Uh, because as I'm saying, the uh, agenda items that we're dealing with, uh, I think we have exhausted, but uh, uh, you can also raise an issue when the opportunity uh, presents itself, which you think maybe it's relevant to them. Uh, acting DG and maybe DM at the, at, at the end of the day. That's the question. Um, Honorable um, Banzai and, and Honorable Members, um, I'm hoping that uh, DM will answer this one. But as government, I think Minister has presented uh, our position that it uh, respects the integrity of each and every country. Um, so since then, we have not received a, a different position on that. But uh, DM, if he's here, he can respond to that. Thank you. Uh, DM, uh, do you want to say something, not only on this one, but also as your closing uh, remarks or input uh, on the whole, uh, uh, items that we dealt with uh, today. Uh, if uh, you can uh, uh, kindly say something, if there is something, and also on what uh, Honorable Fiber is, is raising. The DM, are you with us? Uh, let me see. Yeah, the, the DM is on the platform, but maybe he might also have uh, some challenges. But uh, Honorable Faba, that's the response uh, from the acting uh, DG. And I think maybe the minister will be better placed uh, to deal with this matter. Uh, but uh, we've heard what we are saying. Uh, and uh, also, here yeah, we're international uh, relations. Uh, committee and uh, were not represented by any other uh, organization or any structure except ourselves. And then the department uh, <clears throat> is the one that articulates uh, positions on behalf of, of the country and the government. So uh, I think we will leave this matter at that level, and then uh, they take what the acting DG has said. 
the, 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 the articulation of the minister. Honorable Ngozi, is there thing, something that you want to guide us on on this one before we then uh, conclude the meeting? And any no, other member, the reverend? No, Chair, I, I am not responding to Honorable Faber. And um, uh, I, I welcome the fact that the question is raised and the minister may give a response. It, however, must be noted that um, the country is represented in its foreign policy positions officially by uh, DECO and the principal um, person thereof is the country. I mean, the country's president, firstly, and then the minister who articulate our foreign uh, relations policy. That being the case, Chair, I think uh, if you take you from what we are told officially uh, is a South African position. That doesn't mean that individuals, organizations and, and politicians cannot take stances on, each and, on any issue that is happening at an international level. We've seen this uh, several times. We've seen the leader of the DA going to Ukraine, expressing his views. He was clear he's expressing his views. Uh, trying to influence government to act otherwise, uh, and we have not raised this issue. So in line with our constitution, constitution and, and, and the principles therein involved that there's freedom of association, freedom of expression, of opinion, and uh, of, of uh, um, association. We shouldn't really temple those. Uh, what people say, ultimately must be guided by what our constitution allows and it doesn't allow. If our constitution were to say that nobody can go to a war-torn area and express uh, their views, yes, that would be the case, but our constitution doesn't say so. That's my mild response, uh, but if you want a radical one, I can give you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Nkosi. Uh, I think we are starting now to experience some uh, network problems, but that uh, uh, brings us to the point of uh, concluding this very uh, fruitful and very empowering and enlightening uh, meeting and the presentations. Thanks to DM Botes, uh, the acting DG, Ubabu uh, Pungane, and uh, ooh, 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 what is it? Uh, Chaban uh, for the very informative presentation. And that uh, concludes uh, our meeting. Thanks very much. Uh, see you next time. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you, Chair.